Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about Ceres, the object that we haven't discussed in a very long time. And we're going to be talking about some of the recent discoveries from this very unusual and very beautiful object. And one of these amazing discoveries suggests that Ceres might be the closest object with a liquid ocean on the inside. Let's talk about this and welcome to What Math. Specifically, we're going to be discussing the Okator Crater that you can see right here. That's probably the most famous feature of Ceres. But before we talk about it, what exactly is Ceres? Since this is not really an object you're going to find in most school books, it's very likely that many of you have probably never even heard of this object. Unless, of course, you watch TV shows like The Expanse, where Ceres plays a very important role. Up until early 2000s, Ceres was known as the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. Essentially, that's the object you find between Mars and Jupiter. But eventually, the scientists realized that unlike other asteroids, this one seems to be spherical. In other words, it seemed to actually resemble a planet. For this reason, it was almost added to the planetary list. It was going to be Ceres and Pluto, and uh, these would be the smallest planets in the solar system. The second largest object in the asteroid belt is actually Vesta, which is only a little bit smaller than Ceres, but as you can see, it's not spherical. And this is sort of where the main difference between these two objects uh, begins. The main reason Vesta looks like this is because of the composition. This is mostly a rocky object, whereas Ceres is more of an icy object, and because it has a more icy composition, it was able to acquire the spherical shape. Today, it qualifies to be a dwarf planet, and so this is technically the closest dwarf planet to us. And since the distance here is just a little bit farther than Mars, then if this object does have some sort of a liquid ocean underneath, it would make it the closest non-Earth object to us that has a liquid water. But Ceres is also a very good visual representation of why we even have these dwarf planets. Try to take a guess how big is this compared to planet Earth. Just imagine it in your head. Okay, done? Well, here you go. This is Earth in comparison to Ceres. Now, this probably makes a lot more sense why we call these dwarf planets. As a matter of fact, if I were to put the moon next to Ceres, here you can kind of see that it's essentially the size of the larger spots on the moon. So next time you see the moon, you can kind of imagine the total size of Ceres as well. But unlike a lot of other objects, specifically dwarf planets and even some of the other planets in the solar system, we've actually gotten really lucky at studying Ceres to an extreme detail. All of this was because of the groundbreaking dawn mission that NASA launched a few years ago that officially is finished, but the data from this mission is still being actively analyzed. This mission was pretty incredible in that it used ion engine propulsion on a NASA probe to change the orbit of this probe from the previously mentioned Vesta, which also of course orbits in the asteroid belt, to Ceres. Essentially, this probe was the first uh, craft ever to change an orbit from one object to the other. But it also spent a really long time around Ceres, and at the end was orbiting really, really low, at roughly around 40 kilometers above the surface. And during the few years that it was around Ceres, it was able to take some of the most incredible pictures and measurements of the actual surface and even the inside of the dwarf planet. But to date, most of the studies and most of the curiosities about Ceres were actually related to this right here. So there is this crater known as Okator, and inside of this crater, the mission discovered these unusual bright spots, scientifically known as faculi, which is maybe not the best name to name a scientific object, but I guess it happened. Apparently, in Latin, it means little torch. But anyway, over the years, these features have been studied quite extensively, and a lot of different theories were proposed, trying to figure out what's actually happening here and what's causing these unusual, very bright patches. Here's actually one of the better representations of what this might look like if we were to look at it from this orbit. And over the years, the conclusion to this unusual phenomenon was that it was actually salt from evaporated, really, really salty water that we usually refer to as brine. In other words, if you were to put a lot of salt in the water, you can turn it into the so-called briny water, which is apparently even saltier than the water right here in the Red Sea. And these types of brine waters usually have very unusual properties, specifically when it comes to 
really, really extreme temperatures and conditions such as the ones in space. We've already kind of identified some deposits of brine water in Mars, for example, but the Martian brine water is not as exciting as this because here this is a very recent activity and it also seems to be actively pumping out this water from inside the dwarf planet. Now, first of all, the crater itself is one of several such objects, but in this case, we know a lot about this crater already. For example, we know that it's about 20 million years old and it was a result of a collision with the dwarf planet. We obviously don't really know what collided with Ceres, but it was powerful enough to most likely produce a lot of cracks inside the dwarf planet. And through these cracks, the water started leaking out, evaporating and eventually leaving behind these bright spots. Now that's essentially what the recent studies have identified and discovered. But the question is how did they find out all of this and how do we know that there is an ocean or technically a big lake inside of Ceres? Well, they analyzed the details of the salt itself, the white material on the surface, and discovered that a lot of the salt was so-called hydrated sodium, also known as hydrohalite, which is only found inside ice that's very salty. Here on Earth, we can only find it inside extremely salty water ice. And this extremely salty ice can only be a result of brine water inside Ceres. And during these infrared observations, this was the first time this unusual compound was discovered outside of planet Earth. Further observations also discovered that a lot of the salt here still had tiny, tiny amounts of water inside. And because briny ice usually evaporates within maximum 100 years or so, it means that a lot of these deposits are relatively recent. And it also means that some sort of a cryovolcanic activity, like the one we've observed on Enceladus, is probably still going on on Ceres and is releasing pretty large amounts of salty water. At the same time, the gravitational measurements of Ceres determined that, for the most part, it seems to be a lot less dense on the outside and a lot more dense on the inside, as if the top layer here was all sorts of ices and the lower we went, the more muddy the layer became, eventually becoming more asteroid-like. Which is of course also how the object was probably able to create its spherical shape. Without having so much ice on the surface here, it unfortunately does not have enough gravity or enough mass to become a sphere naturally. But the thing is, the actual division line between the ices and the solids here is not as specific. As a matter of fact, it seems to be very diffuse. In other words, the density here on the surface is very low, and then it sort of suddenly starts decreasing to the point where it becomes solid. But there are still signs here that even the lower parts of the dwarf planet seem to be full of the salty water or brine water. But we also have discovered quite a lot of organic materials in these salts, so whatever is inside this water is really interesting. In terms of the size of the potential lake inside Ceres, and here is Ceres for comparison once again, it would be most likely the size of one of the Great Lakes in the United States. So it's not really a super large body, but it's still large enough considering the size of the object. In other words, this would be a lake that's around a thousand kilometers across or about 600 miles or so, and would be about 25 miles or about 40 kilometers in depth. So this is a pretty large and a pretty surprising discovery. At the same time, what's important to understand here is that we don't really understand why some of this water is still coming out. Unlike other objects, like for example, unlike Enceladus or unlike the volcanic moon known as Io that orbits Jupiter, here Ceres doesn't actually have anything next to it to create enough tidal effects to produce enough energy on the inside to then release this water. In other words, for Io, for example, the reason the volcanism here happens is because Jupiter is very, very close to it, as are a lot of other moons, and this creates a lot of tidal friction on the inside and a lot of energy is generated this way. This energy then comes out as volcanoes. Ceres is pretty much completely by itself in this region, there is nothing close to it, and so a lot of this energy inside is generated by something. That of course is a very interesting mystery that we would like to resolve. At the same time, if there is a liquid ocean and there is some sort of energy being generated inside Ceres, this of course might provide enough reason to consider this to be a potentially habitable object as well. There might be some sort of a primitive life here as well, assuming of course that this object can generate the energy on the inside very similar to how 
various hydrothermal vents work here on planet Earth as well. But unfortunately we're not going to really know more about Ceres until the future missions. The Dawn mission ran out of fuel and it's been put in an orbit where it's going to pretty much stay there forever or for like a really long time and the reason why the scientists chose to put the Dawn probe in the permanent orbit around Ceres is because they don't want to really accidentally contaminate the dwarf planet. We don't really know what's already there and if there is something here we might accidentally cause some damage to it. In other words, the NASA scientists when they discovered the organic molecules on the dwarf planet made an assumption that there might be life here after all. But there are currently talks about a potential future mission around 2030s or so, so in about 15 years from now, that might consider going here, landing here and even retrieving a few samples. Landing on Ceres is not particularly difficult because it's actually pretty close to us, so this would be very similar to the asteroid mission known as OSIRIS-REx that NASA is currently trying to finish. But whether this mission ever happens or not, only future will tell. Until we discover more about Ceres though, that's kind of all I wanted to mention. I guess it's pretty exciting to know that there is this object out there that has this really large underground lake inside of it that's not really on planet Earth. But what's more is that this object is not even that far away from us. It's a relatively close object, just a little bit farther than Mars. But until we discover more about Ceres, that's pretty much it. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something you might have not known before. Also, maybe support this channel Patreon or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt that you can also find in the description below. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.